My name is Colette Mazzuccelli. It is a pleasure, dear listeners, to welcome you to this Camp Rukban podcast episode, the latest in the LIU Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices series, hosted by Olivia Stevens. During my time as a professor teaching for years on the diverse faculty of Long Island University, LIU Global, it is inspiring to me to encounter the revolutionary concept of world education, introduced by Morris Mitchell in his volume written after the Second World War. In World Education, Mitchell writes, one learns more quantitatively and thoroughly because the learning is acquired through the motivation of purposes beyond the learning itself. As we reflect on the fragile nature of interconnectedness in our present world, and the centrality of human security for the population inhabiting our planet, we realize that institutions of higher education may enhance learning in community during the uncertain time in which we live by listening deeply. Online learning in a classroom without borders can never substitute for the in-person, on-campus experience. The online community does not aim to replace face-to-face interactions. It is meant to introduce a diverse and plural encounter, one that welcomes distinct local knowledge to inform each virtual seminar that is taught. In this podcast episode, our aim is to discuss the humanitarian work of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, SETF, a 501c3 organization that engages on the ground in the country, notably in Rukban, a largely forgotten internally displaced persons camp that we purposefully visit in my LIU Global classes, learning across continents, in our research together in community, and in our mapping using Esri software. During the opening months of the Biden administration, We rely on the testimony of courageous Syrians, notably SETF Director of Detainees and Public Speaker Omar al-Shoghri, who appears before the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs. As Omar speaks, we listen and learn about the humanitarian crisis and concerns during the ongoing conflict in Syria. In a different yet complementary way, This podcast episode aims to raise public awareness in conjunction with an Esri story map, which visualizes the plight of those Syrians displaced in conflict and brings their life stories to light. Thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this LIU Global Journey to discover Syrian hidden voices. Muaz, thank you so much first for joining us today. What percentage, uh, Muaz, of of the younger people there would you say are university age? Uh, is there a percentage, or are they all you know much younger? I think that the the, the biggest percentage are are much younger, um, but there is uh, I think a, a quite a big um, swath of the camp's population that are sort of high school and university age people and and I don't want to give the wrong number but but I think it's um it's a significant one um you know I think the majority are are younger people um including people that are uh, college and university age with with a greater number of, of children and do you see differences in the needs of the IDPs and the refugees or would you put them in the same category in terms of their needs no i would i would definitely i see a huge difference between idps um and refugees um leaving your home whether you're a refugee or an idp is 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 unimaginably hard and i i can't imagine you know the challenges that refugees have have gone through um but for refugees at the very least they are not in constant danger of um, of of violence uh, or potentially, like for example, um, for IDPs in Syria, whether they're in the north in Idlib 
where they face regular bombardment by the Russian Air Force, the Assad regime, Iranian-backed militias, Hezbollah, or in Rukban, where if the United States uh, military was to withdraw from that base, they would quickly be overtaken by these forces that they feared the most. And so the presence of danger for IDPs is much more um, significant than so the presence of danger for IDPs is much more significant than that for of refugees. Also, when it comes to refugees, and, and not always, but for the most part, refugees are in camps administered by the United Nations um, in safe areas in neighboring countries where beyond um, sort of UN organs and bodies like the World Food Program or World Health Organization or like the uh, UNICEF and, and so on. Um, there's other NGOs and stuff that at least feel secure and have access to be able to cater to these populations. Um, and refugees also, you know, have ways of making it out of their camps sometimes and um, at least are able to get jobs at times or, or other things. So all these options don't exist for IDPs. Internally displaced people, specifically in Syria, do not have the luxury of being able to, of receiving humanitarian aid from the United Nations and its organs. They are very limited in terms of the organizations or groups that are willing to go in there and support them or provide aid or education uh, and what have you. They are in constant danger um, and their camps, their um, places that they've sought shelter as IDPs are very rudimentary. Um, they're, you know, they, they don't even sometimes have the materials to be able to just have a home or, or a semblance of a tent or something. Um, so for the IDPs, they are much, much worse off than refugees. Um, and at the same time, I feel refugees sometimes take up a bigger part of the conversation. You know, people, when they think of wanting to help, they want to help refugees and so on. And so IDPs are also often forgotten, as is this entire IDP camp called Rukban. Um, so they, IDPs are in much, much uh, greater need, much, much bigger danger uh, and a much tougher situation than refugees are. All right, thank you very much uh, for that response, which certainly will help our listeners understand the, the key differences and alert them to the needs, uh, the specific needs of, of the internally displaced persons. That leads me to ask you about Idlib, about Idlib province. And perhaps from your perspective, Moaz, because you mentioned the IDPs in, in Idlib, you can give us a sense of the present, the present context in Idlib uh, why is this so serious? Why is this such a cause for concern for those of us who are, are watching Syria closely? For I think for the general population, let's say, of, of, of Americans and, and, and others, you know, people think about Syria and they assume that the war is over. Um, often the only thing that sort of, you know, thing that they think about when it comes to Syria is is ISIS, which, uh, you know, you know, territorially has been defeated and, and so on. But the fact is that the war in Syria is by no means over. And ISIS itself is a symptom of the brutality of the Assad regime in Iran and Russia and the lack of action of the international community. And the Syrian people have had to face you know, all of these adversaries, Iran, ISIS, Russia, the Assad regime, etc. Throughout the war, as the Assad regime, especially in the past few years, with the big support of the entire Russian Air Force and Hezbollah and Iranian ground troops, um, the, has been able to sort of garner more control over areas uh, in Syria. But every time that the Assad regime took over an area, say the suburbs of Damascus or Dara in the south or Aleppo in the northwest um, or Hama and Homs in, in central Syria. When, when the Assad regime, its allied forces take over a place beyond decimating it completely, destroying the infrastructure, targeting schools and hospitals and so on, the local populations um, that are in these areas the last thing that they want is to to live under Assad regime control because it means you can arbitrarily be arrested and tortured to death if just for the wrong look uh, or just stopped at the long at the wrong random checkpoint. And so, as these 
as the regime has advanced, people from all over these areas, Aleppo, Homs, Hama, Damascus, Dara, Zor, etc., have all run away to Idlib province. And so Idlib province isn't just its own population. It's also a microcosm of Syria. It's, it's also a microcosm of Syria. It is people from every part of the country um, that have had to run away from the oppression of the Assad dictatorship and uh, have sought refuge in Idlib. And so Idlib's population, which pre-war was closer to 2, 2.5 million people, has swelled to around 4 million people. Uh, a million of them are children. And the population, more than half of it, comes from every different part of Syria. Um, Idlib is today the last remaining sort of bastion for all of uh, these millions of people uh, and opposition to the Assad regime um, that have sought refuge there. And for Assad uh, and for its allies, Iran and Russia, they don't believe in a political solution to the conflict in Syria. As a matter of fact, they only believe in a military victory, one which has been greenlit for them with the inaction of the international community. And so for the Assad regime to be able to quote unquote, declare victory, military victory in Syria, for him, it must mean the overtaking of Idlib province. And for those 4 million people, it means one of three choices. Either they will be killed by the bombardment, the cluster bombs, the white phosphorus, the chemical weapons, all used in Idlib, the barrel bombs, or they be displaced further, becoming refugees, which has easily the potential to double the refugees in Europe, all of which also you know, can't return home because of Assad um, and because of the conflict that's ongoing. Um, or they would be detained, which is the worst nightmare for a Syrian civilian. People would rather die of a chemical weapon strike or a cluster bomb or be shot than be arrested um, by the Assad regime. And, and Hopefully this is something we can discuss in, in future podcasts as well. Um, so you have in Idlib province, essentially an ever shrinking space uh, where 4 million civilians, a million of them kids are seeking refuge, a completely closed walled border with Turkey. And in this ever shrinking space, it's ever shrinking because of the encroachment and the military operations of Hezbollah, Iranian backed militias, the, the Assad regime's military, including its air force and ground troops, and the Russian air force and uh, other uh, supportive forces um, that are trying to close in slowly on Idlib. And if we allow major military operations to continue to uptick in Idlib, where there has been a tentative ceasefire that has been constantly broken and and uh, alarmingly, uh, just in the last few days, there's been an uptick in attacks. For example, uh, a couple of days ago, we had seven attacks uh, in the same day, uh, all again within this quote unquote ceasefire that's there. Um, this is really scary because I think it signifies uh, major military operations that will happen. Um, the fact that the world is quiet or unaware of Idlib and what's happening there uh, makes it even a higher chance that, that these military operations will continue to um, escalate. Um, and they have the potential for huge atrocities, uh, humanitarian atrocities and death, as we've mentioned. They have the potential for massive refugee flows that could double the, the number of refugees in Europe. And of course, this has beyond the moral and humanitarian and, and atrocities that could happen. Um, it also has major implications on regional stability, European stability, and U.S. national interests uh, and, and security. Um, and, and, and we can go into the details of, of, of that as well if we need to. But um, in Idlib today, uh, people from across Syria that, that really are the mosaic of the Syrian people that have gone out calling for their universal rights and protesting nonviolently um, for their liberty, freedom, and democracy are now 
in a place where they are at the mercy of Assad, Iran and Russia. And it's our I think it's our responsibility to ensure that the killing in Idlib ceases, stops and that there's no further escalation of violence. Um, but that's something that unfortunately we fear is what's coming. Um, we uh, at the Syrian Emergency Task Force are actually currently working on an Idlib report um, that should be finalized in the coming weeks that spells out specifically the risks uh, uh, of humanitarian atrocities and the risks to our national security interests uh, here in the United States uh, if Idlib continues to un unfold the way it does now. Um, and uh, in Idlib province, we we all, we run a school for orphans in a women's center. In the past four or five years that we've run these institutions, they've been displaced multiple times. We've seen some of you know little kids get injured and others die and just horrific things. Um, and it's called the the Wisdom House. Um, and and so I, I just was mentioning that because maybe sometimes people can can relate more to specific institutions or individuals than if you just give them numbers: four million civilians, a million kids in in this area. Uh, so Idlib is really one of the highest risks of, of humanitarian atrocities that could unfold in Syria. People should really pay attention to it. And Idlib itself should be a red line. The, the, you know, the, the, the killing in Syria overall must stop. And in Idlib, um, this area must remain a safe zone for these refugees or these internally displaced peoples that have nowhere to go, including the residents of the province itself. I appreciate uh, that that detailed response. What do you see at this early phase as the priorities of a of a U.S. policy towards Syria under the Biden administration? Well, I think that the number one thing that I would hope that the Biden administration does, which is for now, it doesn't seem like this is the way things are going. But but I I really hope that Syria is not put on the back burner. Um, something to be dealt with later um, because we've seen when we have not acted uh, about Syria, we had been forced to act later. You know, when we didn't act about on our red line when it came to the chemical weapons strike and we allowed the deter deterioration of the situation in Syria, we then had to come in later with an international coalition to defeat ISIS, a symptom of sort of the horrific situation that we let percolate and continue in Syria. And if we do not act, and if we don't make Syria a priority uh, in the hopes that we help bring a political solution and resolve the conflict there, and most importantly, end the killing um, in Syria, then we are going to be forced to, um, you know, to, to deal with it from a national security perspective later. Um, and so I, I wanna say that for our interests as the United States, they completely align, our national strategic interests align completely with sort of the right thing to do in Syria. Protecting and saving lives there is in the best interests of, is in the best interests of the United States and our allies and the region and stability and countering terrorism. I think when it comes to uh, the major policy recommendations, one, we must make clear by working with our allies um, on ensuring that a major military offensive does not uh, unfold in Idlib province. Uh, and the way that we can do that is, in, in, in we're not talking about deploying US military, we're not talking about major military intervention. We're talking here about studying what we've done right and wrong in Idlib, seeing what allowed the situ like what allowed this current to relatively holding up ceasefire to take place uh, and in pursuing that. And, and the way that that's worked in the Northwest is that um, Europe, Turkey and the United States all have a vested interest in not seeing a million more refugees going through Turkey and onto Europe. Uh, and not seeing major escalation violence there. So the Turks uh, at the time, and Turkey has at times played a positive role in Syria and at times have been playing a negative role in Syria. 
in Idlib specifically is mutual interests, I think, for all the parties to, to stop the violence there. And so Turkey's willing as a NATO country to have, uh, you know, its troops inside Syria and provide some sort of deterrence. And the role that the United States must play is one of uh, strong diplomatic support for an end to uh, the killing and aerial bombardment and ground troop movements into Idlib and against civilians. Uh, by the way, the the you know in Idlib, schools and hospitals and residential areas are specifically targeted. They're not um, collateral damage, and so making diplomatically being very strong in terms of messaging that that this will not be acceptable increasing um, economic sanctions on Assad regime military uh, structure and and funding and, and, and everything that fuels the military machine. And that could be done through the strict implementation of the Caesar Act, which the Biden administration has already come out and said that, uh, quote, we will not be lenient on the implementation of the Caesar Act. And so that helps lower the capacity of the Assad regime and its allies from pursuing major military operations uh, in Idlib uh, against these civilians um, and in coordinating logistically and in terms of intelligence with our NATO ally on the ground that's willing to sort of have um, troops on the ground to help deter uh, another major offensive. Um, another very important policy uh, recommendation is that we, as the United States, must get back uh, to the table. We have, in a lot of ways, under both uh, President Obama and subsequently even more so under President Trump's um, administrations, have ceded um, the negotiation table and the political process of Syria to Iran, Russia, and Turkey. Um, and by doing so, you know, we've gone nowhere. Um, the United States must have a clear strategy for a political transition uh, and solution to the conflict in Syria. We must once again be engaging with our allies um, and at times our adversaries to ensure um, that we reach a point where the killing in Syria ends and we can begin um, a transition um, and, and to some semblance of normalcy that can allow the millions of refugees to return home and internally displaced people as well. Um, and, and that means that we need to have... We need to make sure Syria is a priority. We don't need to just sort of put it on the back burner to deal with later. And we need to ensure that there is a Syria envoy that has the level of respect and high profile to where it sends a message to Russia, to Iran, to the Assad regime and to the world and to our allies that the United States is serious about helping resolve this problem. Um, and, and so we're hopeful that whoever becomes the US Syria envoy um, will be able to play that role and, and whoever it is, you know, will be someone who um, has the expertise and the gravitas to be able to show, to broadcast that the United States is back and in and, and, and helping resolve the situation. When it comes to humanitarian aid and stabilization aid, a lot of the stabilization aid was ended under President Trump's administration and the humanitarian aid has been hindered by the Russians and the Chinese who often veto, you know, cross-border aid uh, in into Syria, specifically into Idlib, for example. So currently for the massive amount of internally displaced people, there is now a single cross-border uh, point where UN aid is allowed to go in. That's called Bab el Hawa uh, border crossing, which is uh, between Antakya Hatay province and Idlib province. Before that, we had three. We had Yarubiya, which goes into the northeast. We had Bab el Salama, which goes towards like Aleppo uh, from Gaziantep in Turkey. And we had Bab el Hawa. The Russians and the Chinese. Um, made it sort of impossible and vetoed uh, these border crossings, allowing only a singular one to be open for literally millions and millions of people. And even that singular uh, cross-border point is, uh, is set to expire in July. Um, so I think for the Biden administration, the challenge will be how do we force Russia not to stop 
um, cross-border humanitarian aid into Syria, not to stop the only existing point left that's going to expire in July, but also to ensure that we reopen Bab al-Salama, that we open Yarubiya, um, because that's really, really important just in terms of providing any humanitarian aid to this massive amount of people. Um, and uh, finally, when it comes to Rukban itself, opening a direct road of aid directly to the camp or allowing and helping the transfer of camp residents to an area not under Assad regime control where they could at least have a chance at getting a job or finding aid or educating their kids or, or having medical aid available. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, response. What do you think, uh, if, if there is one, is the balance to be struck between, on the one hand, the Iran dossier, which I believe clearly is going to to be an important dossier for the administration, and this need to to make sure that Syria does not fall between the cracks. Syria must not be a card that's played in in sort of a separate negotiation. And the crimes that unfold in Syria and and, and those criminals behind them must be held accountable for them. Um, I think... I think it's really important for the administration um, when they look at Syria and look at Iran's role in Syria, um, that that is treated completely independently from any other uh, sort of diplomatic priorities that may be out there. Um, I'm, I, I don't want to argue the wisdom or or lack thereof of, of, of pursuing a, a deal with, with Iran. And the fact is that Iran must be prevented from developing uh, a nuclear weapon. And that should be done also in a way that, you know, hopefully through diplomacy, through uh, carrots and sticks when it comes to sanctions. Um, but that should be hyper-focused on sanctions that affect Iran's ability to uh, enrich uranium or pursue chemical weapons, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, nuclear weapons and, 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 and so on. But we cannot give sanctions relief, for example, for Hezbollah uh, in Syria or for Iran's military role in Syria, just like we shouldn't give sanctions relief for Russia's military role in Syria or for Assad's killing of his own people. And so my hope is that as the administration pursues uh, a, a new potential Iranian nuclear deal that they make the negotiation and the carrots and sticks that go along with that, you know, focused on Iran and its ability to, to you know, get a nuclear weapon or not and so on. But it does not mean, and, and there should not, and it should not be that uh, Iran will get a, a green light or a blank check to conduct all of its nefarious terrorist activities across the region and particularly in Syria where they're the most pronounced um, in exchange for some sort of deal uh, uh, on the nuclear issue. Uh, So I am hopeful for two things. I'm hopeful that the administration will take a lead in doing all it can to ensure Iran does not you know, is not have the ability to have a nuclear weapon. And hopefully that's done through sanctions and negotiations and some sort of deal. But that should not be at the expense of Syria. And the crimes that unfold in Syria should be dealt with um, independently and outside of any other uh, sort of negotiation, because we shouldn't be, um, you know, compromising when it comes to the slaughter of innocents and uh, that will result in, in major security you know, national interest and security issues for us anyway, uh, in the long run. Um, We don't know how things are going to exactly play out. uh, And so I don't want to be pessimistic or overly optimistic. Um, I do, I am cautiously optimistic and hopeful um, that some of the individuals within the administration that we've worked with very closely and we've had many meetings with and they've met our colleagues and and, and, uh, individuals we work with like the hero Caesar and others, people like Jake Sullivan um, and Tony, Secretary Tony Blinken, uh, you know, will will make sure that that the mistakes that had been done in the past, for example, under President Obama's administration um, in Syria are not repeated um, and that we do all we can to ensure that Syria isn't again a victim of some 
other negotiation or deal uh, or is not ceded and given away to to Iran, Russia, and the Assad regime to do what they will with it. What, in your estimation, uh, for Syria, would be the most positive role that Turkey could play if um, these circumstances should come to pass, if we should see these refugee flows out of Idlib, uh, which certainly we hope does not come to pass, but if, if it should, how do you see a, a constructive Turkish role possibly emerging, or do you see it emerging? If we get to the point where there are massive, massive flows of refugees um, into Turkey once again, I think we're already too late. Um, and unfortunately, the world usually, and the Europeans and even us here in the United States, start paying attention when we see massive refugee flows, right? 2015, for example, we see hundreds of thousands of people going across into Europe. Um, for that brief moment, everyone has some sympathy to that little boy on the beach uh, in Turkey uh, that was found sort of dead by a by, uh, uh, Turkish official or, or, or policeman. Um, and so that is usually when things are too late. Um, because right now you have a massive wall uh, between Idlib and, and Turkey. And if it came to these massive refugee flows, it means people are literally willing to take the risk of being shot or having to just climb over the wall and so on just to make it out to some safety from from Idlib and, and, and from areas where there's major military operations aimed at displacing them in the first place. Um, so I, I hope that we don't reach that point again, because if we do, then it's a matter of infighting between Turkey and Europe on, well, what are you going to do with this massive new flow of refugees? Are the Turks going to just let them sort of get on boats and head over to Europe or, or not. And the fact is that Turkey, as with all other regional countries, are filled to the brim um, with refugees already beyond their capacity. Um, millions of Syrians are, are in these regional sort of countries. And so I don't know if they have the capacity to, to help more. Um, and that creates also domestic problems for them. I, you know, looking at Turkey's role in Syria, I would say in the Northeast, it's been not a great, uh, you know, they've not been a great actor when it comes to the Northeast. But when it came to the Northwest, they do have a vested interest in ensuring that they don't have major refugee flows into their country. But they seem to be alone in that. Um, it seems to me that the Europeans and the United States and others sort of only then pay attention when things have already like hit the fan and things are going well. So I think what's really important is that preventing these flows from happening. And to do so, it means working with um, Europe and the United States, working with Turkey as a NATO ally in this region where there are mutual interests, despite the other friction that may exist between Turkey and the Europeans or Turkey and the US when it comes to Northeast Syria, et cetera, and ensure that these massive refugee flows are not do not happen. Um, because I think at that point, it'll, it'll be too too little too late, um, just like we saw back in 2015. And I think it's important to know that back in 2015, when we had these major refugee flows, this is the time that uh, extreme right wing parties took power in, in some, you know, um, Eastern European and Central European countries. It's the same time that Brexit happened happened uh, where the buses in London had giant pictures of Syrian refugees crossing over into like Slovakia or something. But but it was you can tell that the implications that come out of us, of our inaction on the humanitarian disaster and the refugee crisis in Syria became real national interest problems for, for our allies and for Europe. Um, and so from now, Turkey, the United States, which has NATO troops on the ground and checkpoints in Idlib, uh, Europe and the United States must work together to send a clear signal to Russia, Iran and the Assad regime that we won't just sort of sit by and allow the extermination of civilians and the mass displacement of civilians. If not because we care about human life, uh, 
it should be because we care about our national strategic interests and those of our allies. And so that should be prevented from ever happening. Because I think if we get to that point, it's already too late. And and, and my guess would be that if major refugee flows roll into your, uh, Turkey from Idlib due to massive bombardment and humanitarian atrocities, um, uh, you know, that the world maybe sort of allows to unfold like we've done so many times in Syria. Uh, my assumption would be that Turkey would open the floodgates to Europe um, and it would be very tough to blame them. Taking the time to be with us uh, to share your insights on this uh, LIU Global podcast uh, today. Uh, on behalf of our host, Olivia Stevens, this is Colette Mazzuccelli with Muaz Mustafa, Executive Director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, saying thank you to our listeners, and we look forward to our next podcast. Be well.